Hello and good morning from the Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. I'm Bart van Ark. Uh, I'm a professor of productivity studies at AMBS uh, and I'm also the director of the Productivity Institute, which is a UK wide institution to deal with productivity issues. Um, welcome to this session titled Greening the Economy and how that will help drive productivity or may not help and what the barriers and the hurdles and the challenges are to actually get that done. It's a, it's a complicated topic. There's a lot going on when you green the economy and what that impact will have on your, on your business performance. So uh, I, we're going to depend this morning on an excellent panel of uh, panelists here. Uh, first of all, uh, I won't be doing the interview on my own. I will be joined by my colleague, Professor Alvia Uyara from the Alliance Manchester Business School. She's a professor of innovation studies. So bringing productivity innovation together in this conversation, we'll hope to put a, few, a couple of good questions to our panel. Hi, Elvira, good to see you. And then we have two panelists uh, from the sector, so to say. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Lauren Pama. Lauren is the uh, director at the Green Finance Institute. Uh, and there she is program director for the Coalition for Decarbonization of Transport. This is an industry-led coalition focused on developing new financial products and solutions to mobilize capital at pace and scale to accelerate the uh, decarbonization of transport. So uh, um, uh, Lauren is very much focused on the big opportunities and the big projects. It's great to have you on here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hi, Lauren. And then last but not least, we have Kevin Lambert. Kevin is the resource efficiency lead at a Manchester Grove Company um, here in Manchester. Kevin has more than 20 years of experience in energy and carbon management, supporting national and international government agencies and private business. And, has a, a, a huge track record built around uh, client engagement focused on delivering uh, the qualified benefits that minimize operational risks, increase profits, and identify market opportunities in the net zero economy. So lots of uh, practical stuff to look at, I hope, today, uh, Kevin. And thank you for joining us also at pretty short notice. So it's great to have you on here. OK, so let's introduce the topic a little bit. Um, as I said, greening the economy is, uh, is our topic uh, this morning. And uh, of course, to, to adapt and to mitigate the, the effects of climate change, um, you know, we need to make investments in net zero. And those are a key priority for government, for business, and for society as a whole. But how much do we really know about sort of the long-term effects of these kind of investments on employment, on investment, and on, on productivity growth? Uh, will the green economy indeed generate returns to make these investments in green technology uh, viable, both from a private and from a public perspective? And what are the long-term strategies that are needed to stay the course? And how can green finance, which we'll talk about a bit of, well, this is the finance day today in the Climate Action Week, how will green finance help uh, for all of that? So to kick off the discussion, I'm going to spend you know, a couple of minutes with Kevin, and then Elvira will take over and spend a couple of minutes with Lauren. So, so Kevin, um, my first question, you having been doing this for a very long time, um, when you talk to businesses, you know, it, it seems to be like challenging for businesses to get on this path. Uh, you know, the positives of doing this, of course, everybody wants to go down this net zero route, but at the same time, there are risks because you don't quite know how this is going to play out. Of course, we don't know how climate change is going to play out, but we also don't know how the regulatory environment is going to play out. We don't know how our customers are going to respond to the investments that we're making in, in the net zero uh, economy. So when you talk to your clients, how are you dealing with these, uh, these upsides and downsides of making these kind of investments? That's a big question. Um, initially, when we're talking to clients, if, if it's the first sort of engagement and they're at the early stage, then the easy um, approach is to look for some of that low hanging fruit. And I know we've been on this subject for about 30, 40 years of trying to get people to improve, but not everybody else has. Um, there are lots of simple things that they can do. And generally speaking, if it's something that the business can see, then they can relate to it. So the easy ones, are if they can see an, imp an immediate improvement, or you could take them and demonstrate that somewhere else, then they can buy into it. Now, that could be as simple as lighting, just changing the lighting to LEDs. They can see the benefit visually. Where it gets a lot more difficult for companies to make the decision, and it's where it's hidden in inefficiency. So if you are talking about uh, changing motors and drives on a production line, they can't see it. So it makes it a bit more challenging to realize that benefit. Now, you can see it on the bottom line. You can see the cost savings. But often 
if you make an investment of five or ten thousand pounds on a new motor it'll get lost it, the savings can get lost in the noise of production that's going on in that factory over the course of weeks and months so they don't immediately see it so i think for a lot of businesses the challenge comes with having the confidence about what they're investing in and that confidence comes from the quite often if you're a smaller business you are constrained in terms of resource and you don't have that technical understanding or if you do have it that resource is already stretched and it's difficult for them to invest the time so i think for a lot of businesses if they can get the right support and it's gives them clarity then the decision making process isn't that hard doesn't mean that the resource efficiency opportunity always wins out because what you tend to find is that it's always competing with a lot of other decisions that the business is making and those other investment decisions i'll put this uh one example would be you might have an operations director coming forward with a great opportunity to save invest in a project and their forecast it might save 10 or twenty thousand pounds over the course of the year now that investment goes straight to the bottom line it's pure profit Whereas you might have the sales director come in and saying, well, if we had a new fleet of cars, we could go out and get to the customer quicker and we could win more work and then we could make more sales. So the MD is now trying to compare apples with pears and it makes it very difficult for that decision. So they tend to go with the ones they're used to making and investing in energy efficiency or resource efficiency isn't a traditional thing that they're used to dealing with. So it sounds to me when I hear you talking, when companies go down this road, they need a strategy. Uh, this is not something you can do on an ad hoc basis and say, oh, there's a regulation coming out and let's just, you know, let's respond to this and, uh, or let's, let's do something good for our customers. It sounds to me that you need to get everyone on board and you need to have kind of a long-term strategy here. So when it comes to the investment decisions that companies need to take, to what extent is that sort of strategic setting important in order to take the right decision and to create the, the support uh, and the confidence in the company where everyone playing to make sure that this will ultimately be to the benefit of the organization? To get the most success or the most impact, you're absolutely right. You do need to look at it more strategically. Um, there's lots of examples of ad hoc approach and the, the, even those ad hoc ones still provide or deliver benefits, but those only carry you so far. And I think one of the key elements here is getting the, the, the managing director, uh, the chief exec on board and getting them to see the real benefit. And quite a few of these uh, people in that senior management sort of position, there's multiple things that are hitting them at the same time now, which is, makes it a great time to put that strategy in place and when i say multiple you've got your own operational costs that you need to drive down those costs to remain competitive but you've also got customers now starting to ask more and more probing questions because those larger customers are looking at it from their green credentials and they're trying to deal with their scope one and two emissions which is their own operation but they're very keen now to engage with their supply chain to address their scope three emissions so the senior management now are looking at this in terms of there's operational efficiency, but I also need to do it if I want to continue to be a supplier. So I think the, the strategy in putting that in place is definitely needed to get those longer term investments. And I think there's a lot, we've worked with a lot of businesses. Um, some you could say are in that very small sort of operational side. But even they are thinking about this in terms of their customers and how can they open up the doors to new customers by having that clear message and having that transparency about what they're doing. We're working with one company called Creative Apparel, who they, they actually work in the fast fashion industry. Mm -hmm. But they're looking to design and build a whole new factory, which is digitally enabled, which can respond to customer demands almost automatically. But it makes it a a lot more efficient and it's that vision and having that senior management understanding climate change understanding the drivers and the motivation a lot of businesses out there they're not there to be bad they don't they don't want to just make a profit they actually do they do care about what they're doing and they do care about how they are seen and they understand 
that they need to do something. It's just getting them on that position to be able to make those steps and having the senior management put in place a strategy. But the challenge is always going to be their time. They are always time constrained. Yeah, time constraints, skill constraints, which we'll talk about a little later. Yep. Uh, and also, I think you know, I'd like to talk a little later again about the different functions. It seems to me the CFO or you know, the financial director is a key person here as well in terms of getting on board with these longer term investments. But we'll pick up that a little later. Uh, before I hand over to Elvira, you can put in questions. Uh, though please do that at any time in the Q&A because then you know, we can take a look at it and we'll pick them up uh, during the conversation. So please do so at any time. And with that, Ovira, I'm going to hand over to you and start of our conversation with Lauren. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bart. Um, so we, we've been discussing how um, uh, companies make decisions, but of course, the um, public sector also plays a key role in terms of providing a sound, coherent, stable and credible uh, environment, kind of uh, public policy that is long term and that enables um, investment that can crowd in um, and guide uh, um, private investment as well. Because the estimates of the amount uh, of investment that is required to reach the net zero targets by 2050 are uh, uh, around 40 billion or is, is, is huge investment. Um, and this will is particularly the case in areas such as transport and buildings. And I know Lauren is an expert in, in, in transport, which um, will play a crucial role in decarbonizing our energy suppliers. Um, so I guess my, my first question is in terms of the technological solutions that can contribute to uh, decarbonization of transport, because the difficulty here, I suppose, is how do we know uh, which activities uh, are environmentally sustainable uh, can support the UK transition to net zero of all the, the possible um, uh, uh, technological solutions. Uh, so where do we, how do we guide investment to the right ones? So um, Lauren, that, that, so that would be my first question to, to Lauren, who's an expert on, on transport. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Elvira. Um, I think financial institutions battle with exactly that challenge. What is the winning technology and, and what is the right thing to invest in that, that you know, won't in a couple of years time turn out to be you know, the next diesel, not that diesel's all bad, but um, so I think, I think understanding that sort of technology risk and being able to mitigate that risk and account for it is really important. I think, in a nutshell, we can probably say that, that government are there to sort of create those markets and then the industry is there to provide the capital, the services and the, the technology to deliver that. And introducing those new and unfamiliar zero carbon technologies um, to industrial processes that have been you know, honed to maximise efficiently efficiency brings some uh, uncertainty and potential near term competitive disadvantages to first movers as well. And that does pose a challenge then to those mainstream capital providers. I think financing those highly uncertain investments in new technologies where we think public capital has got a role to play to de-risk some of that investment for the private sector. Um, critical to de-risk the investment life cycle of that new technology and that longer term infrastructure so that private finance can then be deployed at scale. And I think in terms of helping investors understand what is the technology that they should be investing in is, is where there's a role to bring together academia, science, along with that investor community, just to really build the knowledge and, and the expertise. Um, I think also there are things like the UK Green Taxonomy will help. So that's going to be the playbook that really identifies and helps investors understand what is an environmentally beneficial technology and what can count as a green investment. And I think including these sorts of new technologies and, and uh, being able to describe them in that in that green taxonomy will be really helpful in understanding what they should be investing in and, and more importantly, what they shouldn't be investing in and need to divest away from. Yeah, that, that idea of the green taxonomy, I think that, that will be very useful in guiding, guiding investment. Um, and um, because the... 
um, key financial institutions you were mentioning that key actors will play uh, a key role will probably need um, a lot of actors um, uh, kind of coming in and also I guess a lot of um, financial innovations as well uh, in terms of how we make sure that um, you know uh, uh, you know there is there's an uptake of these green solutions um, so what will be the role if you like um, of different players do we need different players do we need different financial innovations uh, to drive this agenda yeah I think we do I mean I know you sort of said 40 billion is needed I, you can find all sorts of different numbers I was you know doing a bit of research ahead of this um, ahead of this panel and found a number from 2018 that said actually is that there's potentially a, a an investment gap of 180 billion euros per year between now and 2030 if we want to meet our net zero um, climate investment target so there's big numbers involved but I think critically it's not one large wall of money it's a series of discrete investments in different activities across different sectors involving different parts of the financial system so for example venture capital is going to have a role to play in um, investing in that early stage technology or new disruptive business models but those funds rarely invest hundreds of millions of pounds in a single venture you then got the pension and sovereign wealth funds, which are some of the biggest project and infrastructure investors globally. Uh, they've got the sort of sufficient patient capital and ability to invest at scale. And collectively, they've got around $17 trillion under management. Um, but as you'd expect with pension funds, they're pretty conservative in their investment approaches, generally with limited appetite for technology risk. And then you've got banks that can sit somewhere in the middle, typically waiting for that technology risk to reduce, but often with a shorter payback period. So it's really a case of identifying what is the right type of finance at the right time, and then the right type of finance mechanism for the right solution. There's no one size fits all. So a big part of what we do at the Green Finance Institute is to try and at a sector level, identify where the money's needed, what are the financial innovations that are needed to unlock that capital at the scale that's required? And where can public finance intervene to be most effective at creating those conditions for private finance to invest at scale sooner than if it's left to its own devices? So I think it's really around government money to kind of create that market and de-risk the investment and then crowding in that private sector capital to, to really get it mobilised at scale. So do businesses have a good sense of um, how to sort of streamline those finance decisions, where to you know, make good use of public uh, financing that is available, where their own investment has to come in. Do they have a good roadmap to go here or is it a, a jumble of different instruments and hard for them to figure out when to step in and when to add their own investments? Yeah, I, I think that probably varies across some sectors. So I think, for example, in transport, um, the, the sort of financial incentives and, and fiscal policies for investing in invest uh, you know switching your fleet to electric vehicles for example are quite well known and, and communicated and there's a roadmap for things like benefit in kind that means it makes sense for company car drivers to transition um, but i think in in other areas it's probably not that well known what the financial incentives are what the uh, the green mechanisms are for raising finance and, and making that investment so I think there's probably more to do to, to help companies understand the money that's available and the options that they've got either for government support or for, for private finance in the space. Okay. Uh, I think there's some occasions which make uh, businesses wary of the investment. And that's when certainly when government policy changes and then there's a negative impact. So the Example of that would be uh, photovoltaics PV on roofs, where when the government then changed, so they changed how they interpret it so that your business rate took into account the value of the PV on the roof as well, so it increased your business rate. And I think that nobody saw that in advance. And there was a lot of money being spent, a lot of businesses were trying to move in the right direction, and then suddenly they come with a larger bill. I think those sort of, sorts of things um, put off 
some of the investments when they can perceive that as a potential risk that they cannot mitigate against in the future just by a change of policy. And I think consumers face that risk as well with things changing at short notice, things like the Green Homes Grant um, yeah. that was introduced and then withdrawn not that long later. So there's definitely some, um, there's definitely a role, I think, as we were talking just before we went live about stability and that policy stability is really critical, particularly then when it comes to getting the finance mobilised as well, because financiers want to know that what they're investing in is the right thing and, and the environment's there to, to create that for the next few years. You also mentioned earlier, Lauren, that, you know, obviously there are different financing mechanisms here, you know, including traditional banks, institutional investors, um, uh, venture capitalists. Um, a question to both of you, I think, is uh, do, do companies have a good sense? What is the right time to, you know, go to any of these institutions? And do they understand the differences in terms of what the institutions can offer them in terms of making these investments? Do you want to go first, Lauren? No, go on. You go. You go first. Okay. Um, across the country, there are uh, the local economic partnerships have established uh, growth hubs, of which I'm part of one. Now, this does vary across the country, but there are people providing or set up within growth hubs to provide advice to help companies access finance. They're not providing the finance themselves, but it's helped to try to steer them. But the challenge will always be for a lot of businesses, I think. Um, they tend to think about the traditional mechanism, which will go to the bank to get an additional loan, certainly on that small to medium sized business, where the, the investments in the hundred thousand pounds sort of mark are a bit, a bit lower than that. They usually go to their traditional route and they're not fully aware of that full set of options that they have. I don't believe. I think some of them are, and there's definitely examples of it. But in the mainstream, for a lot of businesses, they just think about it in terms of, do I want to put, do I want to take a loan from the bank or not? Yeah, and I think that's, um, I think it's also very resource intensive, particularly for small businesses who maybe don't have a lot of specific financial expertise or, you know, aren't at the scale yet where it could be an owner, an owner manager, someone's developed something new and wants to try and commercialise it, making that um you know, getting that finance when they're not a finance expert, really resource intensive going around looking for it. And I think that presents a challenge as well. So solutions, I think, that can bring investors together with companies that are looking for investment so they can you know, have that conversation once or twice rather than having to trot around, you know, 10, 12 different investors looking for finance will be really helpful. And I think that's where things like innovation labs and organizations like the Faraday Institute bring to get, try and bring together sort of days where they can get the small businesses looking for finance to talk to that investor um, community and just have that conversation once a bit like, like speed dating for companies looking for finance, I think. So I think that's what they can really help. Just another yeah. thought yeah. I have. Sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have worked with, um, one of the larger companies in the automotive sector and their approach, they were looking to identify opportunities to try to help them to go at the time, this was a few years back, carbon neutral was the terminology that was at the front and center at that point. And they were looking at all of the opportunities and then trying to break those opportunities down by classification of how they could finance them. So some would be straight for them to finance. Others would be whether they go to get um, a loan and others, what they also looked at, because they had multiple sites, is an ESCO model, which is an energy service company coming in. They take the risk, but in this, they take the reward in terms of the savings out of the bill. It's, I know on the continent that's worked quite effectively, but it's never really been successfully implemented at scale in the UK. So it's private sector investment. They come in, they provide the solutions, they deliver against that plan, and they take a share of the savings to fund the actual investment. It's always it's had some bad press in the UK. There's been a few examples where it didn't work, but certainly there might be something that we can learn from the continent about whether there is a role for an ESCO type model to be supported, financed potentially from a government position, but to get something which then will actually create significant change. It's actually that, that you, you 
you mentioned examples from uh, other countries. I was actually going to ask how do we compare with, with other places? How do we, um, are, are there any good practices that we can learn from, from elsewhere in terms of financing, green technologies, and also the type of, of technologies that will be um, of greater opportunity, particularly in the Northwest? Can I have a first attempt at this one? I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it all. Um, there are, I mean, the UK has put in some very good policies and then, as Lauren rightly pointed out, also quickly removed them at some point. And I think um, it's the examples of where it's been really effective tend to be where there's been long-term stability in that. Whatever that solution is, it, there's been long-term, because it takes it, bit of time for the businesses to come around to it, to feel comfortable with it. And, and it might take them six, 12, 18 months, 24 months before they're prepared to bring an idea forward. But in, a, in Europe, there's been lots of countries where they've maintained the same thing and just kept it. And it's just gradually built up and been much more effective. And there are other things, I think in Germany, if you have ISO 50001, then there is a tax benefit associate um, for those on the call who don't know, 50,001 is a, in effect energy management. It's an ISO for energy management. Um, but if you have that as a business, there is a tax benefit directly paid back to that business from the government. And I think there are mechanisms that can be put in place that would be very effective. But if there was one thing, it would be stability in whatever the policy or whatever it is to give it time to run its course rather than changing it. I think specifically on the on green finance, the UK really led the way in establishing a, a green finance hub and we still now rank as a leading centre for green finance depth and quality in the global green finance index. Um, the UK institutions are at the forefront of agenda setting and advocacy on climate change. And we've really been leveraging our influence trying to accelerate the development of a green global financial system. I think our presidency of the G7 summit this year and COP26 means we're going to continue to lead those discussions. We've got a really strong track record of it, attracting international corporates and issuers here to finance their sustainability objectives. Just in terms of some actual statistics, um, the London Stock Exchange was home to the first certified green bonds out of China, India, Middle East and Canada first sovereign green bonds from Asia Pacific and the Americas. We've got over 260 sustainability related bonds from 23 countries, which raised over 56 billion pounds. Um, more than 90 green equity issuers, those who uh, generate at least 50% of their revenues from green activities with a combined market capitalization of 140 billion. We were the first G7 country to legislate for net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, and so I think we have been doing really well. We've also launched the first sovereign green savings bond for retail investors earlier this year. And all of our major banks offer green loan programs. So I think we're, we are um, leading in some respects from a financial perspective. But I think there's obviously more that we can continue to do. Um, if you look specifically at technologies, I guess Norway's been sort of poster child for electric vehicle adoption. And I think, as Kevin said, that's because they've had very long term stable policies that have promoted electric vehicles. Um, and then we're seeing France leading the way on nature based financing solutions as well. They're doing some really great, great things and in investing in their um, natural capital. Let's turn to some of the, the questions, some good questions coming in. And I, I'll start with the, the second question. I'll come back to the first in a second to, to you, Lauren. Uh, first of all, Cecilia saying, proud to see AMBS in the discussion. So are we. So thank you for, for that support. Um, Lauren, you, you mentioned players and no size fits all investments. Uh, do you see companies and financial institutions investing in natural capital driven by local institutions and councils, which with carbon offsetting and sequestration projects instead of traditional investments in the value chain? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on nature-based um, solutions, but actually just yesterday, the Green Finance Institute issued its report, its first report into financing nature and the, the gap that there is in that space for, um, for investments. 
Um, I know that Greater Manchester Combined Authority as well are doing an awful lot actually on uh, natural capital, looking at reinvesting in things like the peat bogs, etc. Um, so we are seeing that financial institutions are interested in this. I think the, the challenge is how do you account for something like a, um, how do you account for biodiversity on your, on your balance sheet? And it's only when we can do things like that and actually account for nature and assign it some sort of value that I think you will see more um, businesses and financial institutions start to put money towards it. Um, so that's that I think is the the challenge there and that's why we're we're doing quite a bit of work on the nature side to um, to get that to get that moving because it you know it needs to it needs to happen we're losing biodiversity in the UK and you know it's a it's a critical part of um, our reaction to climate change. Kevin do you want to add to that? Um, the issue with on the question, I think the, the natural capital is extremely important, and I agree with Lauren. How much we are losing is shocking, um, both in the UK and globally. But the other challenge that we've got is in that question is around the carbon offsetting side. I think certainly I would uh, I'd be more in favour of um, if you were if you needed to do the offset and you tried to do it locally. So I think there's, a, there's value to doing that and you can relate to it. And it also helps in terms of that social value of what's going on in the community as well. But it's the offsetting aspect. And I think um, science-based targets, WWF, um, all are of the opinion that the offsetting is for the residual. So that's when you're looking and you've addressed, you've invested the money in driving down the impact today rather than necessarily drive looking to I know this is a glib statement, but planting a tree which won't actually sequester the carbon for many years, many years down the line. So I think, and I think it's WWF who have a gold standard offset and scheme. It, they also put out a briefing note to say, don't do offsetting until it's the last resort. And they're operating one of the gold standards. So they recognize it should be that last resort. It's not to say if you're a business and you've got lots of spare cash and you want to donate it like Patagonia do on a regular basis, you could invest in offsetting, yes, but that's in addition to investing in driving down your own impact. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really important point, a good point. Um, let's go to the first question there. And Kevin, I'll start with you there. It's a question by Nikolai. For business preparing themselves for the outcomes of climate change, is there a difficulty in encouraging them to invest now for mitigating damage losses later? Is there a general attitude that investment will come once the problems arise? Climate disasters would surely wreak havoc on profits across most industries. So it's really about you know how do you balance this uh, mitigating versus um, uh, you know the immediate investments you need to do now. Um. <clears throat> I'm still hopeful for COP26, but the IPCC report um, that came out in August and its latest modeling pretty much has all of the scenarios are predicting we will go above one and a half degrees centigrade by the middle of the century. In 2018, they stated if we go above one and a half degrees, it will be a catastrophe. So the IPCC is, uh, is basically saying, we're, we have a real, real problem. And what I'm hoping from COP26 and I'm hoping from the business community is they'll recognize that they now need to take action and take it fast. I think for a lot of them, a lot of companies have taken a lot of action and they have been working on this for 10 or 15 years. A lot of the, the terms that are coming out now about the, the science-based targets, the Paris Agreement, the net zero targets are coming out from some of the larger Fortune 500 companies, because they've been working on this for 10, 15, 20 years to get to the point of where they can feel more comfortable about saying what they're doing. But I think for the, the other businesses who are coming at this a little bit late, there is a lot of opportunities for them to make practical, pragmatic investment that will save them. We, we deal with companies still where you could go onto their site and you can identify about 30% of savings. Of that, at least half will be in that no low cost sort of aspect. Payback, 12 months, 18 months. 
The other remainder will be on that larger investment side. So there's lots that they can actually do. And I think businesses is definitely a shift in the business community, certainly over the past two to three years, where they are now realizing that it is something, it's a challenge for them that they have to take up. And part of that is that supply chain pressure that they are feeling. Part of it is the pressure for their the younger generation in terms of their workforce and they're seeing people move um, out because the, the millennial generation is now looking at it going, I want to choose an employer who I believe in and I can has the same values. And now I see that they're on that when the management is sitting there, the feeling pressure from their staff and the feeling pressure coming in from the supply chain, they do want to act. It's just they need help. Laura? Yeah, I think that's true. And, and in terms of needing to take action now, you know, the Environment Agency, I think, have come out today and the, the headline, it was very late last night on the BBC News and it seems to have disappeared off the front page this morning. But Emma Howard Boyd, who's, who's our chair and the chair of the Environment Agency, said, you know, it's adapt or die. And that's the language we're now using because we need to, to take action now. And I think there is a risk that, that without sort of... Um, coordinated efforts and groups such as ours that are trying to bring together people and actually get you know money moving there's a risk that people sit and wait and then you're left with a disorderly transition you know just as we sort of run up into the, la the last few years or we leave it too late and the cost of trying to um, adapt to climate change becomes prohibitive prohibitive because we've missed the chance to invest now and, and try and mitigate um, you know some of those impacts while we while we still can. Um, so I think partly businesses and finance perhaps are sitting to wait because, and consumers as well, actually, because they just don't know what to do. Um, so I think there's a big piece for education and, and to try and explain mm. what needs to be done and, and how that could be done and how it could be financed. Um, and yeah, I think if, you know, if we just sit around and, and wait, there is a risk that it that it won't happen. So that's why I think government's also got a role to play to set those clear policies, to, to set some um, perhaps shorter term milestones as well, so that people understand the path that they're on to take between now and 2030, not just that we can sit and do nothing until 2028 yeah. and then suddenly react in the last two years. And that actually answers uh, somebody on the chat said, you know, it's technology plays a role, but behavior change to scale plays a big role. And I think that's what you're both saying. So, so Elvira, I think it's a nice segue to this whole issue yeah, of skills, Yeah, I, I was right? going to say that yeah. there was another question, uh, but it was placed in the chat instead of the Q&A, but now it's been moved to a Q&A, so that's, that's uh, very, very handy. Uh, and it actually connects with what you were talking about, uh, coordination, coordination of kind of a complex ecology of actors. Um, so someone is asking about you know, sustainability is an inherently complex topic which involves many environmental and social issues. So how can professionals from different fields, finance, environmental science, etc., get together to develop holistic solutions and whose responsibility is it to bring the stakeholders together? So a bit related to what you were just talking about in terms of, um, you know, how do we make sure this coordination happens? But so it's a lovely segue into what we do at the Green Finance Institute. So we take a sort of sector led approach and bring together then a coalition of, of experts from across academia, science, industry, local and national government, finance, not for profits, and really bring those people together and say, what is it that's stopping decarbonisation and what's getting in the way? And how can we then co-design and, and innovate the sort of financial solutions and mechanisms that are needed then to, to mobilize that capital? I mean, there are, I'd say there are all sorts of groups coming together and, and working on this. A lot of the time we find that finance isn't in the conversation and, and needs to be because actually it's, whilst it's not the silver bullet and it's not, it's not the panacea, what it shouldn't be is, is the blocker. So it's, it's great that we're sort of coming up with solutions that can, um, that can help combat climate change, but unless those solutions can be commercialized and scaled up, then we're not gonna achieve those, those net zero targets. So, I mean, in terms of whose responsibility it is, you know, we're playing our part on the, the finance side, but it's, you know, it's, it's everyone's responsibility, really. We've, all, we've got a collective responsibility to, to do the right thing while we, um, while we still can. Um. 
I think the only thing that I would add to that, certainly in terms of the, the, the LEPs, the local economic partnerships, they recognize the roles as well. And they try to convene and bring the, these key stakeholders together. But um, from my perspective, I see some of the challenges are, and it's, it's in the question, they are very diverse and the people are coming at it from a very diverse perspective. So it's quite, I appreciate this is being recorded, but I'm still going to say it. It's like herding cats. I think you've got so many different views and different angles and they're all valid, but it's trying to bring them together to get a clear direction in this year. And that is a challenge, I think. There's more work to be done. Yeah. Well, so a follow up to that, I suppose, is how do we make sure we have the right capabilities and the right skills? So I, I guess it will involve some kind of retraining uh, of, of people in the financial sector and professionals. Um, so I guess this is particularly uh, related to La Lauren um, in terms of the work you're doing um, in terms of skills. Uh, so how do we make sure um, people are well equipped to make the right decisions? Yeah, sure. So there's there's definitely a role for for education and, and green finance education. So we launched our green finance education charter earlier this year, and and that's making sure we work with people like the Institute for Chartered Accountants and um, the Chartered Banking Institute to really try and get green finance onto those um, programs and uh, syllabuses. That's the word I'm looking for onto the onto the syllabus, so people kind of um, have the opportunity to learn about this. We are seeing as well, you know, uh, some universities launching climate climate finance uh, modules within, you know, sustainable finance and within their economics um, uh, economics degrees, for example. So um, I think there's uh, there's a there's a lot being done, and there's probably more to do, and it you know it almost needs to start with the, the STEM activities in schools as well. So we need to be really talking to people right the way from primary school about climate change and I've got a nine-year-old son and I know they talk about some of this at school already but it's it's really important that they really understand why and and you know because they're the ones that are going to be in 10 years time kind of coming out into the jobs market and and these are you know it's going to be these green jobs and green skills that that will be vital. Some of this and maybe Kevin you can pick that one up uh, some of this is also, I guess much more practical vocational skills in the company, right? You, you, you make a step towards you know, a net zero project uh, and it just requires another way of thinking uh, about how you, how you do things in your business. So to what extent do companies engage in vocational education programs or apprenticeships and things like that to drive this green transition? Um, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the business. It is to a degree, just a case of a different lens that you're wearing. And it's just seeing it from a slightly different angle. And I think for some people, it's quite easy. So if, if you're looking at doing an engineering project, you do it's the same sort of thing. Just you're working out the cost benefit and you work out how that will plug into the, will the machine work, whatever it is, or the design work, and then what are the benefits associated with it? The, I think part of the challenge is a lot of the environmental benefits can you can get the cost benefit quite quickly, but the environmental benefit and the reputational comes later. And that's the bit where the engineer who's developing something might not actually see it that way. And what they've gone with traditionally is I'll build it, I'll make it 30% bigger, that way it will work and it'll be robust, it'll also be very inefficient. So it's getting them to see it from a different perspective about how they want to, you want to do something, you want to implement something to make it work as needed and as efficient as possible. And that's not necessarily in, in their training and their apprenticeships, making it as efficient as possible hasn't always been the primary driver. It's always been make it so it doesn't fail. And I think it's just seeing it, and I think there is definitely a need within apprenticeships, some of those practical skills where there is more training needed. And we've worked with a lot of people um, on the factory floor and the operations guys where they just haven't seen the opportunities, even though it's once you show it and once you identify it, that's fine. It's not a whole new language they've got to learn. It's just a slight tweak to what they do. 
Yeah, this is a great conversation and we only got 10 minutes left. So, uh, so Elvira, what's the question you definitely want to put into this conversation? And then also people online. Oh yeah, I've just seen another question come in, but why don't you put in your own question first, Elvira, and then we'll take the question online. Um, okay, thank you for putting me on the spot there. <laughs> ah, well, I'm sure you have a whole list. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> um, one of one one area of interest to to, to of mine is uh, the role of the battery sector in just as kind of um, uh, setting up policies and, and regulating and and, and setting dire direction for investment, but also being a, a buyer itself. Uh, through uh, public procurement and I know in transport, for instance, this is important in, in many areas. So how can the public sector um, play the role of an intelligent buyer or um, informed buyer uh, of, of green technologies? Um, is that happening? How can it be done better? But I think, um, I think, as we said before, government can lead the way in, in setting policies, but also then in, in sending those demand signals. So in setting clear procurement targets for green technologies. So, for example, I, I think the government said um, a couple of years ago that they want 25 percent of public sector fleets, for example, to be zero emission by 2025. I think those are the right numbers. Um, and so setting those targets does galvanise action. I think those procurement targets can also create the demand that, that drives economies of scale for currently costlier green products. So, for example, 9% of emissions from buildings come from public buildings. So if the government can bulk procure solutions such as ground source heat pumps or, or hydrogen boilers to transform that, that building stock, that could send the signals to um, and enable manufacturers to bring down their production costs if they're securing a, an order that's of that size. So I think that's where government have got a role to, yeah, to really to send those demand signals and um, and increase the uh, increase the economies of scale. There's a couple of other bits where the, the public sector is already demonstrating some of the things that you're talking about there. So within for national contracts or any public contract above five million pounds. Uh, the bidder needs to be able to demonstrate that they have a clear plan for net zero by 2050 in order to be able to bid. Um, mm -hmm. This has been implemented, this was brought in, um, I think it was July this year. I think there's, there's a little bit of uh, wiggle room in terms of ones that are ongoing at the point, but the plan is certainly to ramp that up so that you can't even get to the point of bidding. At a low, that's a, that's a, national sort of guidance for all public sector contracts above five million then you've got at the local level um so i'll take uh, manchester city council for example it puts a weighting of 20 percent on social value which is broader but then also puts an additional 10 percent weighting on environmental so it's got a 30 percent weighting on the space that we're interested in in terms of that climate change and improving that quality of life 30% weighting is quite a lot for a public sector tender and process, but and I suspect you will have more in the more requirements put in on any of those contracts as well. So I could I wouldn't be surprised if, if the local authorities start thinking about setting a minimum bar, a minimum threshold for you to be able to bid for the work. And you see that in in private sector contracts as well now in, in tenders, you know, almost all of them have got some sort of sustainability criteria that they're looking for, for, for their supply chain. So I think it's about that leading from the top again, isn't it? If the large organizations start to do it, then the parts of the, the supply chain that feed into that, you know, your sort of tier two and tier three suppliers have to start to come on board and it, and it, should, drug, uh, it should trickle down. I mean, briefly, I know I'm going slightly off topic, but if you don't <laughs> mind, very briefly, I think, We've mentioned a few times about the supply chain and, and the impact that it can have for trickling down. I think it's very important that any the, the customer should also turn to its suppliers and actually engage with them proactively, because you can get great wins out of that. There's great opportunity. If you can work in partnership, rather than give me this answer, it should be more about come on the journey with me and how can you help? How can we both grow together? And then they can take an innovation or a new offer 
to their customer. Yeah, that's, I think, a really good point. I mean, a lot of this is around collaborating, whether it's collaborating with government or collaborating in your, in your value or your supply chain. And you can have a lot of wins by sort of coordinating the investments that you're making and make sure that your suppliers and your customers benefit from this. Um, we, we have two more questions left, and I have actually also a question, so we have a lot of to cover in the last eight minutes. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, is there a risk, and any of you can pick it up, whoever, whoever wants to volunteer, is there a risk that financing technologies aim solely at decarbonization? Uh, so without taking account of potential trade-offs from a sort of broader system uh, kind of approach, could lead to unintended consequences, environmental and or social in the future. Who of you want to pick that up? I'll go. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'll start if you want. I mean, yes, there's a risk. Yes. Um, of, of course, there's a risk, uh, and that's why it's really, it, you know, we really do need to try and bring in that that systems thinking. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is be investing in in technologies that have unintended consequences somewhere else. I think it's just about making sure we've really done our research, bringing those actors together, so that you're looking at the entire ecosystem um, and just trying to understand what those risks are. And, and I guess it will become a, a trade-off. Um, you know, you've obviously got the, the carbon emissions versus other greenhouse gas emissions versus perhaps local air quality. I mean, diesel's a, a classic example that actually the reason diesels were promoted so heavily was because they emit less carbon than petrol vehicles. But the unintended consequence of that um, you know, has been poor air quality in, in city centres. So I think it's about understanding what the right technologies are, what those trade-offs and risks are, and, and where's the best place to um, to put those technologies into play. Uh, I would wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying there, Lauren. Um, but I think there's also an element where we have to take the best information that we have available, consider the, the broader picture as, as much as we can, but not to the point where there's inaction. Yeah, we have to go with what we've got sometimes. And there may yeah. be a consequence. If we can identify that consequence, we need to put something in place to deal with that. But we can't have no action by worrying about whether there is a risk somewhere else. The second question is as much, I think, a question to you and me, Alvira, as it is to Kevin and Lauren. So any one of us could try and pick that one up is how can we convince investors to focus more of an eco ecological economics approach, prioritizing social and environmental well-being before financial profit than a more traditional economics approach. Um, I will be the last one to pick it up, but uh, if none of you wants to do it, I'll, I'll try to formulate an answer, but who, wants, who would want to go first? Elvira, you want to have a go at that? <laughs> I to focus more on an ecological economics approach than a more traditional economics approach. Well, uh, my background is more about heterodox economics anyway, kind of, if you think about innovation, you have to think a little bit outside of the box and, and kind of a bit of a, in a more heterodox way. Um, so I think we already, I mean, in, in the business school, we're already kind of thinking those, along those lines um, uh, on how you convince investors. Uh, I think they are, well, it's already happening, I'll, I'll say. I mean, you can't escape that. Um, I think the, the, the tide is changing. I think um, uh, there, there is shift in, 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 in thinking of, uh, in these areas, there's a shift in values. So, um, but yeah, I think uh, keeping the momentum, I think is important. Yeah, I, I answer quickly the question, but then post a final, a final question on following up on this to Kevin and to Lauren. Um, I think we're stretching both the empirical and the theoretical thinking around, uh, you know, environment and ecology versus economics. We, we're changing and we're beginning to change our measures of GDP uh, and take into account things like natural capital and the impacts of biodiversity. Uh, you know, we're stretching the concept of productivity to uh, link more to well-being. And in the theory area, which I won't bother all of you on this audience with, we're also trying to really stretch uh, 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 the idea of going beyond the sort of traditional drivers of economic growth, which is sort of technology and uh, labor and capital to, to other key uh, forces that are impacting this. So it's a long road to go, but I do think that investors will respond once you know, we economists and statisticians improve the measures. 
Which leads me to my last question to Kevin and Lauren. How do we measure success? This session was about how does greening economy drive productivity? At the end of the day, you know, when you talk to your clients and your customers, what is a good measure of success? Uh, Kevin, can I start with you? Um, I'll give you an example, if I can. Uh, there's a company that was called Rollington Knitwear, it's now called One and All. It set out on this sustainability journey uh, quite a few years ago. And it actually then changed its entire business model to become employee owned. But it had the, all of the employees bought into that vision and the plan and what they wanted to do. From that start of that journey to where they are now, they have had an eight fold increase in revenue because they have got their employers and everybody is part of this vision. And it is including climate change. It includes the social value. It is everything that they do. They love going to work. They are at a place which is responsible. It looks after its staff. It is doing everything it can in terms of the environment. It held an event uh, last week, not to its suppliers or its customers, but just to the local community to put that message out there. And I think it's those sorts of things where those business models are shifting. That's the important thing. If we actually want to achieve this, we can't necessarily stay rigid to the existing models that we have. Lauren, uh, I was so questioning there in the chat, which is so can business put pressure on government to measure success differently? So any anything you want to pick up in your final comment? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, measuring success is 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 a really difficult question actually and it's one that you know we're asked all the time well how are you going to know that you've succeeded and because it's I think like we said earlier on it's a very long-term goal that we're working towards here so I think there's a need to measure and, and set some sort of shorter term targets and milestones that we can measure ourselves against and I, I think there's a role just to, to think through what those KPIs should be I, I don't think it's a an easy one to to answer it's it's also going to differ by sector so you know for electric vehicle transition for example it could be quite simple you know how, how many vehicles are we delivering what's the percentage yeah. that's that's rolling out there you know have we got a a uk wide charging infrastructure network that you know everyone can access charging when and, and when and where they need it but um but in other sectors it might not be so simple so um, that's not a great answer to finish on, but I, I think it's I think it's really difficult. Well, but um, it's about yeah working together to understand yeah. what those milestones are and. Yeah, look, and, and we're all in this all together, whether it's us academics here at the Alliance for Business Bisco, or you talking to customers and clients in order to develop better metrics and help people across society to really you know get to measures of success because that helps them to also see what the, what the opportunities really are look again as i said an hour flies uh, but i think we got a lot on the table here there's a lot more coming up today uh, i know so we have to hand over to the next session here but kevin lambert of the manchester growth company and lauren Hama of the green finance institute and of course my colleague elvira Guiara. Uh, thank you and um, it was a great conversation looking forward to follow up at some point Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.